On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including the fully aligned James Webb Space Telescope surpassing expectations, NASA's SLS rocket finally rolls out to the launch pad, while a fully stacked Starship undergoes its first integrated cryoproof, and the search for life on Mars is put on hold by the war in Ukraine. So let's get going. This is the Space Race. The first ever in-focus high-resolution infrared image from the James Webb Space Telescope has been released by NASA. This is a major milestone in the ongoing saga of this next-generation telescope that orbits around the L2 Lagrange point beyond Earth's moon. NASA has revealed the first image taken with the fully aligned mirror of the James Webb, which they are calling the highest resolution infrared image ever taken from space. The James Webb team has said that the telescope is already exceeding every expectation they had and is actually performing better than computer models predicted that it would, resulting in higher resolution and better waveform quality. So, what we're seeing in this new image is the same star that we have been watching for the past month. First, we saw it represented by 18 random blobs as a starting point, representing the misalignment of the gold-plated hexagon mirror tiles. Then, the 18 points were arranged to their corresponding mirror segments and brought into focus. Then, each of the 18 images were stacked to concentrate all the light into one single place. The physical tiles were still operating as 18 separate telescopes, all pointed at the infrared camera. To get the result we are seeing today, the team performed a coarse phasing procedure, which is using a piston mechanism under each tile to move it up and down until the segments come together in creating one monolithic primary mirror. And the final phasing is the last bit of alignment that brings the telescope to peak performance, focused together as finely as the laws of physics allow. This fine phasing will continue periodically to maintain the perfect image. We can also see this process in the selfie images that are taken with a special pupil lens inside the main camera. The first selfie looked pretty rough and uneven with off gaps between each hexagon. And now the alignment selfie looks like a perfect honeycomb pattern of tiles. And as cool as it is seeing this one tack sharp point of light, just look at all the stuff in the background. We can already see a handful of galaxies and clouds and all kinds of crazy stuff to investigate just in this one single frame. Officials said at the briefing they will now check the alignment in three other instruments on the telescope, tweaking the mirror positions to optimize alignment for all the instruments. The instruments themselves will undergo tests to confirm they are ready to begin operations. Unfortunately, we still have to wait a few months before getting any serious results from the James Webb. Officials say they will begin science operations when the commissioning phase is complete. Since the commissioning schedule is normally six months long and the telescope launched on Christmas Day, that would be the end of June for full operation. The first space launch system rocket rolled out to its launch pad on March 17th, for a countdown wet dress rehearsal ahead of its long-delayed launch this summer on the uncrewed Artemis 1 mission. This is, of course, part one in our three-part return of human astronauts to the surface of the moon. Artemis 2 will be a crewed orbit, and Artemis 3 will be a human landing. The giant SLS rocket emerged from its longtime home in the vehicle assembly building on a crawler transport machine, making a 6.8 kilometer journey to Launch Complex 39B at the Kennedy Space Center. Once there, the rocket was connected to the launch tower with several umbilical arms. This made for some pretty spectacular video and photo opportunities. The SLS shares most of its technology with the old space shuttle program using the same RS-25 main engines and a very similar main tank with side-mounted solid boosters. In the case of this new system, the crew module is Orion spacecraft on the very top. During the presentation of the SLS, NASA Administrator Bill Nelson said, There is no doubt we are in a golden era of space exploration, discover, and ingenuity in space, and it all begins with Artemis 1. This will demonstrate NASA's commitment and capacity to extend humanity's presence on the moon and beyond. 
With all of the publicity now out of the way, it's time for SLS to get into its first round of serious testing. Crews are doing preparations for a countdown test called a wet dress rehearsal. That work will start with connecting the vehicle to interfaces at the pad and go through tests of various systems. That includes tests of both hardware and software systems on the vehicle and ground equipment. That will culminate in the WDR itself when the SLS course stage is filled with liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen propellants and goes through a countdown that stops at about T-10 seconds just before the course stage's engines would ignite. The WDR is scheduling for April 3rd. About a week and a half later, the vehicle will be rolled back to the vehicle assembly building for any corrective work from the pad tests and for final preparations, then rolled back out to the pad again for the Artemis 1 launch no earlier than June. It might not be the most technologically exciting rocket, and it might even be a gigantic waste of money, but SLS does look pretty damn cool, and we are very excited to finally see it launch. Speaking of gigantic rockets hopefully launching this summer, the SpaceX Starship and Super Heavy Booster have completed their first integrated cryoproofing test. This is where the tanks of the rockets are filled with super cold liquid nitrogen to test the structural integrity. Last week, we saw ship number 20 again lifted into the air by the Mechazilla launch tower and placed on top of Super Heavy Booster number 4. SpaceX used this occasion to conduct a full-stack cryoproofing test for the 420 rocket. We've seen both stages undergo several cryogenic tests on their own, but this was the first time we've seen them tested while integrated. This time, the full stack is likely to test the Stage 0 launch tower and mount systems for loading cryogenic fluids into Ship 20 via the Ship Quick Disconnect plumbing, which will be a new first for the launch tower. Once this test is complete, and providing all goes to plan, the next steps would be to pump liquid oxygen and liquid methane into the vehicle and see what happens. All of these proofing tests are setting the stage for SpaceX to conduct more static fire tests with the Super Heavy Booster. This is going to be the big show. Booster 4 has 29 Raptor engines installed, and we have yet to see SpaceX fire more than 3 Raptors at one time so lighting up all of them at once is going to bring the noise to Starbase. It could also be the point where we see our first booster explosion. As more and more time goes on and more progress is made at Starbase, it's looking less likely that Booster 4 and Ship 20 will actually be the first orbital launch candidates. SpaceX have built several new iterations of the two rocket stages, with various improvements and modifications in the time since 4 and 20 were built last summer. So while Starship 420 might be capable of making it into space, the test would not prove totally useful because the design of those vehicles is already out of date. We're still hoping to see at least a full engine static fire with Booster 20 someday very soon, which might result in an explosion, which will also be very cool. ExoMars is a joint European Space Agency and Russian mission to Mars that is supposed to land a rover on the planet to search out signs of ancient extraterrestrial life. The rover was expected to launch late this year, but due to sanctions brought on by Russia's invasion of Ukraine, ESA has decided to suspend its cooperation on the project, leaving ExoMars in limbo. After a meeting of the ESA Council, it voted unanimously to suspend cooperation with Roscosmos, who was in charge of launching the rover and supplying its descent stage. ESA noted in the statement, We deeply deplore the human casualties and tragic consequences of the aggression towards Ukraine. While recognizing the impact on scientific exploration of space, ESA is fully aligned with the sanctions imposed on Russia by its member states. ExoMars was supposed to use the Russian-made Proton Heavy Lift rocket as its launcher from Baikonur Cosmodrome, and then land on Mars using the Kazachok lander. Both were provided as contributions by Roscosmos, so this is more than a question of just replacing the rocket booster, it would also need a new integrated landing platform. The rover itself also includes Russian instruments and radioisotope heating units supplied by Russia. 
ESA has now launched into what they call a fast track industrial study to look at alternatives for launching the mission, which will place the European built Rosalind Franklin rover on Mars. They are reportedly looking into options with European states or a partnership with other space agencies. One obvious option would be renewed cooperation with NASA. ESA had originally planned to cooperate with NASA on the ExoMars program, but ended up turning to Russia a decade ago when NASA pulled out. The Europeans are suggesting that NASA has already shown new interest in supporting the program. Either way, the new launch window to search for fossils on Mars is set back to at least 2026 in the best case scenario, which is a real shame. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it, that really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.